This video was produced by... Uh, good evening. Welcome to our last public science talk of the year. My name is Bill Brandy. I'm the director of the John C. Wells Planetarium um, two blocks east of here and a faculty member of the Department of Physics and Astronomy. I want to thank the Department of Physics and Astronomy supporting, for supporting our public science talk. It's the second year running that we've done it. Um, and without their help, we could not have made this happen, so I'm really grateful for that. Um, and then I have, of course, the distinct honor and privilege of introducing our speaker tonight, Dr. Scott Ransom. Uh, he's one of the world's foremost authorities on neutron stars. He gave a fantastic uh, department technical talk earlier this afternoon, and he talked about how using these neutron stars, which we'll talk about more generally tonight, how they're doing some fantastic basic physics with them. It's just incredible. A little bit more background on Scott. He's a tenured astronomer with the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in Charlottesville. He's a faculty member of the Department of Astronomy at the University of Virginia. Works with a lot of graduate students. His main focus is on searching for exotic pulsar systems. So these are stellar endpoints, uh, such as millisecond pulsars and binaries. Once these pulsars are identified, he uses them as tools to probe a variety of basic physics, including tests of general relativity and the emission of gravitational waves and the physics of matter at supranuclear densities. Uh, much of his time is spent working on the state-of-the-art signal, signal processing information and high-performance computing software required to analyze the data he's getting, uh, much of it just from the Green Bank Telescope, which we'll, we'll talk about a little briefly, uh, which is just over the mound, west of here. Uh, Scott, uh, I ran into him when he was a graduate student at Harvard. Um, he was, uh, he had just finished being the lead teaching fellow for a popular astronomy class, and there were 12 students that had to work as TFs, teaching fellows, and he had already developed all the sophisticated computer code for all the TAs to be able to enter their grades. I was overwhelmed at that point, and of course, it's uh, continued since then. Uh, let me give you a brief CV. He was awarded a Hertz Foundation Fellowship for a PhD while in his last year as a cadet at West Point. He completed a master's degree in astronomy at Harvard and then enter, entered active duty in the US Army as a field artillery officer. After almost six years of service, he returned to Harvard, completed his PhD thesis on a new search techniques for binary pulsars in 2001. After he graduated, he went to McGill University, Montreal uh, as a Thomson postdoctoral fellow. And then in 2004, he has moved to NRAO. Uh, the National Radio Astronomy, where he's been ever since. In 2006, he won the Bart Bach Prize, which is awarded for distinguished research by a Harvard Astronomy PhD recipient under the age of 35. And just four years ago, he was awarded the American Astronomical Society Helen B. Warner Prize for a significant contribution to observation, observational or theoretical astronomy during the last five years of the award. He has authored or co-authored over 150 publications, including 15 in Nature Science, our most prestigious, prestigious science magazine for, for basic research. So it's my honor uh, to welcome Scott Ransom to our stage. Well, thanks. Uh, now that, now that I, I, I know I'm bored from that introduction, so you guys must be. So uh, hopefully we'll talk about something that's a lot cooler, which is the, the cool stuff that stars turn into after they die. And that's mostly what my talk's going to be about, is what do stars do when they die? Uh, there's a lot that's, that people talk about, about the births of stars. Um, but stars are kind of the engines of our universe. And they're certainly what we see when, when we go outside and look up in the sky. But a lot of people don't know what happens to them after you know, lo long amounts of time, millions or billions or even trillions of years. So that's most, mostly what my talk's going to be about. Uh, and one of the reasons why I'm going to talk about that is because the thing that I study most uh, is, is neutron stars, but particularly in the form of pulsars, which are one of, in my opinion at least, the most interesting things that stars become when they die. So let's, let's start off with a, with a picture of this. This is our, our, our home. This is the Milky Way galaxy. This is a, an actual picture of it because it's taken from here on Earth of the, the plane of the Milky Way. Um, we live embedded in it. It's, the, it's a, a g galaxy that's, that's a disk. It has spiral arms and stuff, we think. We've never actually seen that because we can't go outside of the galaxy to look down in. But what we can see um, are stars. And obviously, our eyes are well adapted to see starlight. Um, evolution made them that way so that we can see the yellow light from our sun because um, that's where stars emit most of their energy. So everything you see here, um, all of the light at least, is, is stars. And there are hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy. Most of them are, pu are puny little things that we can't even see um, in, this, uh, in, this, in this picture right here. 
And most of the stars that we can see are actually quite special. And I'll, I'll show you this during the talk. These are the stars that are the most luminous, the biggest, the most massive, or they're at a certain stage of their lifetime that they become big and bloated and therefore we can see them. But most of the stars in our galaxy uh, we can't even see. And the other thing that you'll notice is that there's all these dark patches through here. Uh, that's dust. And the dust is what gives us the, uh, it's a, actually gives us a problem to look at stars in our galaxy because the dust blocks the light, uh, the optical light, so we can't see through our galaxy. Um, and a lot of the, the work that I'm going to be talking about today is done in the radio waves because radio waves can penetrate that dust and the dust is basically transparent to the radio waves and so we're able to see stars, these dead stars, the stellar undead, that are buried deep in the, in the plane of the Milky Way galaxy. So let's actually look at a little, uh, at a, zoom in a bit and look at a star field. And what I want to, to point out about a field like this, if you look towards the plane of our galaxy, fields of stars like this are very, very common um, because there's hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy. But one thing you'll notice, even by looking at a picture like this, is that there are differences. Even though we see stars as points of light, there are differences that you can even pick out just, just you know, from your seats right there. And one of the biggest differences, obviously, are the brightness of stars. Some stars are brighter than others, and you can see that when you go outside. Even if you're in a, uh, a city where there's a lot of light pollution, the brightest stars are still visible to your eyes. But beyond that, there's a more subtle difference and that is the color of stars. And the color of stars plays a really important role in astronomy. And it's taught astronomers a lot about the way stars work. And you can see these two bright stars right here. This is obviously much bluer than that star there, which is much redder. And the color of stars um, basically tells us um, its temperature. And that temperature can give us a lot more information about what that star is going to do, how it's going to live its life. Let's zoom in a little bit more and look at, see, you can see how there's these bunches of stars. Stars often, especially the most massive stars, which I'm going to focus on, they, the most massive stars tend to form in clusters like this, like I'm showing you here on the screen. And these clusters of brilliant jewel-like stars, they're blue-white in color. These are massive stars, much more massive than our sun. They burn very, very hot. That's why they're blue-white in color. And it's these stars um, that are going to turn into a lot of these weird stellar undead things that I'm going to focus on, uh, on today. Um, but this variety of stars, that, especially the, the fact that there are differences in, in brightness, their luminosity, and their differences in color, there should be some way that we can, we can uh, you know, kind of systematize that. We, you know, we, we can figure something out, make a, 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 a plot, you know, make a diagram that may, will maybe tell us something about the stars. And one of the most famous diagrams in all of astronomy is called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, and, and this is it right here. This diagram basically tells you an incredible amount of, in my opinion, really fascinating information about stars, these, these balls of gas that are out there in our galaxy. And what this diagram shows you, it's basically um, temperature on this axis, and hot, it's a little bit strange. This is this weird historical convention that astronomers have. Hot stars are over here. Normally you think of diagrams like this starting low and going high, but it's exactly the opposite here. And that hot stars are over here, and cold, cool stars are over here. And by cool stars, I'm not talking, you know, like room temperature. I'm talking still 3,000 degrees. Uh, but that's still about half the temperature that our sun is. But then this axis, this is a special kind of axis. This is a logarithmic axis, and a lot of astronomy, um, whenever you show any kind of diagrams, you'll see logarithmic plots. And it's an important concept. It's, it allows you to show ranges of values that it's tough for your mind otherwise to comprehend. So every time you go between two different marks um, in this plot right here, the brightness in this case, in terms of suns, if we talk about this, you know, you talk about a bulb, uh, a light bulb as being like a 100 watt bulb, how many 100 watt bulbs or how many candles does this represent? Here we're talking about how many suns does the brightness represent. If you go between two marks, the brightness increases by a factor of 10. So a star that's at this level is 10 times fainter than one at this level. And notice that there's stars on this diagram over 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, uh, what we call orders of magnitude. That means 10 to the 11 power or 100 billion times 
is the difference in brightness from the most massive, or I'm sorry, from the most bright to the least bright stars. So stars can vary a huge amount in, in how bright they are. And some of the biggest things that affect that brightness, there's three big things, the mass, the temperature, and the size. And what you can see is that stars that are living their normal lives are along this band, and this is called the main sequence. Our sun sits right here in the very center of this band. It's a yellow star, a uh, temperature of about 5,000 Kelvin. Um, there's a bunch of stars. Matter of fact, most of the stars in our galaxy are down here, the puny stars. They're much cooler. The stars that are more massive live up here, and they're thousands or even tens or hundreds of thousands of times brighter than our sun. We tend to think of our sun as being incredibly bright, but it's not. It's a pretty much garden variety normal star out in the middle of our galaxy. So this is where the main healthy normal stars live. But at the beginning and ends of their life, stars are not on this main sequence. They're basically off of the main sequence. And so most of my talk today is going to be spent about what happens when the stars leave this. And when they leave it, at first, they go up with what's called a giant branch here, and then they'll turn and do, and do other, other things. So stars will actually move on this diagram as they live their lives, so to speak. The other stars I want to point out are these guys up here on the top. These are the supergiants. These are the brightest stars in our galaxy, the ones that we can see basically throughout the whole galaxy. If we're on one side, we can see, we can see a supergiant star even on the other side of our galaxy. They're very, very bright objects. And they're very bright because they're incredibly massive, and they do some pretty spectacular things at the end of their lifetime. So another thing, so besides the fact that color corresponds to temperature, which is a really important thing, so the blue-white stars um, are over here, and the red stars are over here. And by the way, that, that color is exactly the same thing as if you turn on an electric burner on your stove, and how the stove gets, gets uh, orange, red hot, that's, that's the same type of radiation that, 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 that the stars give off. If you were to make that burner get hotter and hotter, it would turn yellow, and then it would turn um, a, a, a yellow-white, and then finally a blue-white in color. It's the same exact temperature scale that, that the stars are. So it really does correspond to heat. Um, the other thing that's important about these stars is their size. And these stars, you can see these letters here. This is a, a, the famous uh, nomenclature that astronomers have used to describe the, the basically the masses of the stars. Where you go from the lowest mass stars down here, the M stars, up to the giants, these huge stars here are called the O stars. And there's a very famous uh, mnemonic that many of you might have heard of um, that starts on this, this side. Who, who here knows what I'm going to say here? What's the, what's the mnemonic? Does anyone know? How do you remember these letters? O, B, uh, does anyone know? OK, so the, it's not really politically correct anymore, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, and it's O, B, a fine girl kiss me is the way you can remember these stars. And that, that goes from the most massive stars down to the least massive stars. And actually, astronomers in the last 10 years have found more stars that actually go on the lower end. But the important thing that I want you to show here is that the colors are very different from red to, to blue. The sizes are very different. And that also corresponds to mass, because these stars are all giant balls of hydrogen gas. And if you put a whole bunch of gas together that's this size compared to that size, this thing has got to be a lot more massive. The other thing is, is the numbers of the stars. And most of the stars in our galaxy are those little puny M stars. Here's our sun. And only a handful of stars, a very small percentage, are these really big guys. But they all live their lives by doing the same thing. They all convert hydrogen into heavier elements by the process of fusion in order to make energy. And that energy comes off as starlight. Okay. Now, our sun is evolving and, and, is, and is burning hydrogen into helium, making its fusion, and it has a life cycle. This, our sun is about 5 billion years old. It, had, it went through a birth in a, some kind of a stellar nursery, uh, big uh, molecular clouds, gas clouds. Uh, and then it joined the main sequence of stars, and it's been burning hydrogen gently, quietly in its core uh, for the last four and a half billion years. Okay, so this is where we are right now. But the sun is evolving. It's burning fuel. And, and like any, any type of machine that burns fuel, the fuel gets used up and the machine changes and ages. And the sun does the same thing. 
So gradually over the next few billion years, so don't worry, this isn't happening today on any kind of basis that we can see. This is not what's causing global warming. This is a whole different thing. This is billions of years we're talking about here. The sun will gradually get slightly bigger, gradually increase the rate at which it's burning fuel in its center, and then in about five billion years from now, it goes through a pretty nasty stage called the red giant stage, where it gets dramatically bigger. A matter of fact, it will get so big that it will probably, we don't know for sure, but probably engulf the Earth. The outer parts of the sun will certainly engulf Mercury, will definitely engulf Venus, and might come out and actually engulf the Earth as well. This will not be a good time to live on Earth. But luckily, we have five billion years to figure out a way to get off this planet. What happens after that, though, is where things get interesting. And this is where the stellar undead, uh, undead come into it. Because at the end of its life, we go through this stage from a red giant. The outer parts of the star get ejected. And what's left over is a thing called a white dwarf. And that's the core of the star. The core of our sun, after you get rid of all the other hydrogen, is this highly compressed Core of, core of the star that weighs a lot, probably about four-tenths of the mass of the sun. So a lot of the mass of the sun has been burned down into that core. But when you eject all, everything else out, what you're left over with is something that's about the same size as the Earth. And given that the Earth is hundreds, many, many hundreds of times smaller than the sun, this is a tiny, tiny fraction of the size of the sun. But yet it has a huge amount of the mass. That means that this is, has a huge amount of gravity, and it's a very dense, interesting object. Matter of fact, quantum mechanics helps to rule, helps to hold up this star. There's no more fusion going on there. What's holding it up is quantum mechanics in a very special way. So this is a very interesting, weird process. But this is what's going to happen to almost every single star in the galaxy. The thing is that the stars burn their fuel at very, very different rates. And you, there's a famous saying, you know, a candle that burns twice as bright burns half as long. Well, the stars in our galaxy, the bigger the star, the brighter they burn. They, get, they can burn thousands of times um, brighter than the sun. They will live thousands of times shorter than our sun. So instead of living 10 billion years, the more massive stars might only live millions of years. And even though there's only a one letter difference between those two words, that's a factor of thousands. So millions to billions is a very, very big difference in time. On the other side, the really, really puny stars, the stars that are less massive than our sun, say a half of the mass of our sun, they will live trillions of years. Once again, only a one or two letter difference, but that's a thousand times longer than what our, our sun will live. But eventually, all of those stars are going to go through this stage and turn into a white dwarf. And as I said, unfortunately, during this stage, the uh, Earth's going to kind of get in the, in, in the way uh, when this happens. So we want to make sure that we're not around. It will be beautiful, though, as can be shown by these objects right here. These are the so-called planetary nebula. These are stars that are in the process of throwing out those outer parts of their stars as they're dying. And in the centers, you can see these very bright glowing things. Those are the white dwarfs in the very, very center. So those are the hot cores of the stars that remain. Uh, and meanwhile, the gas that, that is ejected and gradually floats away, and it spreads elements like carbon and oxygen and other dust throughout our galaxy. Those are the elements that then help make new stars and new planets and new life. Um, we're, we're made of the stuff that's ejected from stars just like this. So this is, where, this is what, what's going to happen to our star, our sun, in about five billion years. So that's pretty cool. But what I want to show you now is what happens to the bigger stars. Because the bigger stars at the end of their lives, they, get even, um, they, they do a lot more interesting things. So what happens inside a very massive star, and by very massive here, I'm talking a star that's maybe 20, 30, 40 times the mass of our sun. So you take a 20 or 30 or 40 times the amount of hydrogen, put it all in the, into the same volume and compress it to get gravity going. Gravity pulls it in. Gravity has this big balance um, in terms the gravity's pushing inward, and fusion is converting hydrogen into helium, et cetera, making pressure outwards. So the fusion balances gravity. And every time 
um, you start converting more and more hydrogen into helium, for instance, the star gets a little bit hotter. And eventually, you get enough heat that you can start converting helium into carbon. And eventually, it compresses and gets even hotter. You can convert carbon into oxygen. It gets compresses and gets a little bit hotter. And this happens all over the space of only a few million years. You, you, it voraciously uh, burns all of its fuel in the center of the star until finally you make um, more than a solar mass, more than the total mass of our sun, of iron in the center of these stars. And what happens when you get iron? The problem with fusion, with nuclear fusion, is that you can't extract any extra energy out of nuclei when you fuse beyond iron. So if you, if you turn hydrogen into helium, we get tons of energy, and that's why Fusion is one of the big goals of scientists, of energy scientists here on Earth, because it would be basically an inexhaustible energy supply for us. But once you get to, to iron, you can't get energy, you have to give energy. And so there's no way to get that pressure then. And so gravity is relentless. Gravity continues to pull very, very strongly on the center of the star. But once there's iron, there's nothing holding it up. And so what happens is that core collapses after a few million years. Um, and when that star, um, uh, collapses because the fuel supply doesn't exist anymore, the most massive stars turn into black holes. That center iron core gets so massive that, nothing, that there's not enough pressure that those nuclei can hold themselves apart and it, it initially falls inward. Nothing can stop it. It's, there's too much mass that quantum mechanics even can't hold it up like it will a white dwarf. And the, this object then falls completely through and at the center of the star turns into a black hole. We're not exactly sure what the, out, the, what the outer star does, but part of it is going to go into the black hole. Part of the rest of it is going, almost certainly from some kind of shock wave going to get, get, going to get ejected. Uh, we may have seen this happen in our universe, but we're not exactly sure because black holes, it's kind of hidden on the inside and we don't think that there's a, 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 a super huge explosion um, when this happens. But we do know that it happens because we do see black holes. And just a couple words on black holes. So this is how they get formed, um, the small ones at least. These are called stellar mass black holes. And really they are black. Their light cannot escape their gravitational pull, but you can look at them. They don't suck you in. They're not cosmic vacuum cleaners. They're not going to come hunt you down and eat you. If our sun today turned into a black hole, we would not even know until the light went out eight minutes from now, because that's how long it takes light to travel from the sun to us. And then the Earth would still be going around the sun and we'd gradually freeze to death, but we would not be sucked into the black hole. It's still not a very pleasant way uh, to die, but at least we wouldn't be sucked into the black hole. And here, all you're seeing is the bending of light because of Einstein's relativity of the stars behind. Because the, the gravitation is so strong, it bends light. So these really are truly exotic objects. Einstein's relativity discusses them in great detail, and we don't know what's going on inside of this black region. It's, it's completely unknown, and it's beyond our current physics. Um, so these also are a very interesting end state of massive stars. What we do know about these, and we see them in our galaxy, we can't see them by themselves like this, and, we, and there certainly are black holes that are zipping through our galaxy all by themselves, but we can't see them. The ones we do see have a companion star like this. If there's a big giant star companion that's near another star that already collapsed and turned itself into a black hole, that star will, can let some of its material go into a disk around that star, and that makes a very, very energetic system called an X-ray binary. And tons of X-rays, including some jets and all sorts of light and energy can come out of these systems. And we see these systems in our galaxy. Matter of fact, this one is an artist impression of one, a very famous one called Cygnus X1, which some of you may have heard of. Um, for the Rush aficionados in the audience, uh, like myself, there was a song from the early 70s written about this object uh, by Rush. Um, and it's, it is the first, what most people thought was the first black hole um, that was conclusively identified in our galaxy. So it's a pretty historic um, object. But we see tons of X-rays, that's what the X stands for there, coming off these objects. So these do exist, we see them in our galaxy, and they're very interesting objects for people to study um, these so-called X-ray binaries. But that's the most massive stars. What I'm going to now do is go a little bit, little bit less massive to the stars that are maybe 8 or 10 or 12 times the mass of our sun. 
So not as massive as the ones that made a black hole. These are ones that still do the same burning of, of hydrogen into helium, helium to carbon, up to iron, but they don't have enough to, to burn as much and make as much iron in, in the core. So if there's not quite as much iron, when finally the pressure, when gravitation uh, overcomes the pressure, it collapses, but there's not too much iron that it goes directly to a black hole. Quantum mechanics saves the day yet again and creates what's called a neutron star. And these are the things that I study. And when this happens, we know and we've seen these objects because when, when you create a neutron star, that actually has a surface, unlike a black hole. So when the core of the star collapses, it instantly makes a neutron star. The rest of the star bounces off of that, creates a massive shock wave which rips apart the top of the star, and that's a supernova. We see supernova all throughout the universe. We've seen thousands and thousands of them now. They're some of the most bright ob um, objects in the universe. They last for days. Well, the initial collapse to a neutron star only lasts a second or two, but we see the, 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 the fireball explosion lasting for days. And there's all sorts of great um, articles and, and, uh, and uh, images and movies and stuff on, on how supernova work uh, that you can view on the web. But the important thing for me in my research is how the supernova produces yet another stellar undead, and that is the pulsar. That's the magnetar. These are the neutron stars that result from these stars. Okay? And these objects can be quite interesting. Here's just a picture of what a supernova looks like. Here's a beautiful galaxy. This is a relatively nearby galaxy, and a supernova went off in the edges of it. One of these stars blew up, and the total amount of light coming from this one star exploding is more than the total amount of light integrated up. If you, if you add up all this light, there's more light there than there is from the whole galaxy. Yet there's hundreds of billions of stars here. That tells you how bright a supernova is. These really are extraordinary events. And what they show is the, is the conversion of a live, healthy star into the, its dead stellar remnant, a neutron star. So this is a pretty famous um, field of stars. I haven't shown the whole thing, but I bet some people in the audience can recognize there's a famous part of a constellation here. Does anyone know? Let's just yell it out. Orion. Orion, yeah. So here's the belt of Orion, one, two, three. Here's Orion's, this is a sword, this is the Orion Nebula. Um, here's a big star, here's a big star. This is the other part of his shoulder. There's some nebulosity, and you can see all the stars in the background, okay? The reason I'm showing this is because one of these stars is going to go supernova quite soon. And that's this star. That's Betelgeuse. So Betelgeuse is a red supergiant. It's an extraordinarily massive star. It's near the end of its lifetime. Um, the red supergiant uh, phase, we know that's near when, the, when this thing is going to explode. This is a gargantuan star. If we put that in our solar system, it would engulf beyond Earth, clear out past Mars. Um, I, close to even to Jupiter, I think. It's a gargantuan huge star. And someday soon, probably not this week, it's going to go supernova. Now that could be a million years from now, but astrophysically speaking, a million years is like tomorrow, right? Um, but it's going to go supernova quite soon. But it actually, it could be whenever. We just don't know. We, we could get the galactic lottery and have it go off very soon. Astronomers would love that. Um, if it goes off, it's, it's not too far away in our galaxy. We would get a spectacular light show. It would be visible during the daytime easily. Um, and the amount of scientific data on how supernovas work would be spectacular. But that star will turn into a pulsar uh, quite soon, and I'd be very excited to see that. We do have objects that did go supernova within the last thousand years that we can see in our galaxy. We know that this happens. Okay, here is a very famous object called the Crab Nebula. This, this object is one of the most studied objects in the sky. There's, there's perhaps more papers on this one object that have been written by astronomers than almost any other object. Because this uh, was from a supernova that went off in 1054 AD. So almost a thousand years ago, and we know that date exactly, we know the exact date that it went off because it was observed by Chinese astrologers and, they, and I, know, I use the word astrologers, not astronomers. Uh, they were trying to tell the horoscope for the, the Chinese emperors. Uh, they were not doing astronomy, but they were watching the heavens, and they made some good astronomical measurements. Uh, it was also observed 
uh, by a lot of other cultures. Here's a famous um, painting by the Anasazi Indians, a cave pictogram in New Mexico, where you see there's a, a star, a bright star, that's the supernova. Here's a crescent moon, and that's, that's exactly where we expected to see the uh, supernova with respect to the moon at the date that this went off. And here is the artist's signature uh, right above it, the handprint. Um, what is amazing is that this, is this object, we can still see this object expanding today. When you, wait, when you wait over the course of like 10 years, you can measure how this is still expanding from the star exploding. This is the explosion, is we can see it happening. Most of the time we're not used to seeing things change in the sky, um, but this one is still changing. And you can see it's glowing hugely in the center. That's because it's being powered by an extremely energetic object still to this day in the center. And that's that neutron star. Right in the center there is a glowing blue-white star. That's the core of that star. That's the neutron star. And it's a pulsar. Um, this is from one of the discovery observations, uh, which happened about almost 40 years ago, uh, over 40 years ago. And what they found out astonishingly, and I have to go over here to make this work, was that this neutron star is rotating 30 times per second. That's pretty astonishing. And we can actually record the signals. Let me see if I can get this to work. All right, this should work. So this is, this is what 30 times a second sounds, is going to sound like. Is this is recorded signals with one of the biggest telescopes, the Arecibo telescope, on the Crab Pulsar. All right. So that's pretty annoying. But it's also really cool because, to me, that blows my mind because this is something that weighs more than the sun and all of the planets and the asteroids and the comets and all the dust, everything in our, in our solar system. It's been compressed down to the size of a city and it's rotating 30 times a second. That's ridiculous. But yet, it's right there and we can see it. We can measure it. We can use X-ray telescopes and gamma ray telescopes and radio telescopes and optical telescopes. And yes, if you have really sensitive eyes and use a big optical telescope and you look through an eyepiece, your eye can actually see the flickering at 30, at 30 hertz um, if you have really sensitive eyes. So probably the kids in the audience could probably do it. The grown-ups, probably not so much. Um, but this is an astonishing object. The whole nebula is being powered by this blue dot right here in the center, and it's visible throughout the whole electromagnetic spectrum from the lowest frequency radio waves, clear through the infrared to, to optical to x-rays, and the most energetic ga gamma rays. This object is giving those off, and it's powering this whole nebula. These pulsars are incredibly energetic objects. There it is right there. You can see the blue here is from x-rays. There's all these rings and wisps. And over a course of 10 years, we can see these winds changing in this nebula because it's the energy being given off by the rotation, the rotation from this neutron star. There's no fusion, no chemical reactions. It's purely this energy is coming from the rotation of a neutron star. And the crab is not the only one. We see this throughout the sky. We see these are beautiful X-ray images from the Chandra X-ray satellite of supernova remnants, supernovae. Uh, remnants glow beautifully in x-rays, so Chandra takes really nice pictures of them. And at the centers of every one, there, there, and there, there's energetic young pulsars that are keeping these things alive and glowing. So they, they, they will keep these, these supernova remnants glowing for tens of thousands of years, um, powering them by their rotational energy. So that's what's inside these pulsars. But so where do these pulsars come from? Well, there is a fascinating story, and I, can't, I don't have time to go into it tonight, but I highly encourage you, if you're at all interested in, in uh, kind of the sociology of science especially, um, to, to dig into the, to Google on, uh, on the internet and read about the discovery of pulsars, because it's a fascinating story. Um, there was a professor, Anthony Hewish, at Cambridge University. He had a graduate student named Jocelyn Bell. They built a radio telescope. It looks almost like a fence because it's almost what it was. It's basically a fence post with a bunch of wires strung together. And her PhD thesis was to, to build this telescope and make very, very tiresome manual observations before computers um, of radio signals in the sky. And she found, this is the original trace where they found it, she found this little blip, 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 blip every one point some odd seconds of an object that they had no clue what it was in the beginning. 
They kept it incredibly secret. Um, over the course of the next two months, they found two more. They were blipping on, from different parts of the skies at slightly different rates. And at first, they thought that, this was, that these were extraterrestrial civilizations. Um, and the, the first object, this object, they called LGM-001 for Little Green Men 1, and LGM-002 for the second one. And then they finally, after they found thir three of them from different parts, they said, uh, there, there's probably not three of them all trying to contact us at the same time. And they realized there had to be something different. But with these observations, they discovered the first time neutron stars. And about a year later, after they published this, that's when they discovered, you know, once people realized that pulsars were there, then people looked in the Crab Nebula and found that 30, that, that, that pulsar rotating 30 times a second in the Crab Nebula. And the amazing thing is that uh, Jocelyn did almost all the work, well, a huge amount of the work, I got to give uh, Hewish some credit, but um, Hewish won the Nobel Prize and Jocelyn Bell did not. And this has been a big source of contention in the scientific community ever since. Um, and there was, there's a little follow-up story that happened. Pulsars ended up winning another Nobel Prize later on with a faculty member and a student. And during that Nobel Prize, the student and the faculty member both got the Nobel Prize. Um, so that's probably not going to happen again. But this was a kind of an amazing thing uh, given that it was a woman graduate student who was kind of snubbed by the Nobel Committee. And I should say she's still a fantastic scientist. She's won every other prize in the book in science since then. And she's always been incredibly gracious about it whenever it's brought up. Um, uh, but still, uh, I think a lot of other people think that she should have a Nobel Prize on her wall. But a fascinating story. So this is what our cartoon picture of a pulsar looks like. We have a neutron star. It's rotating about this red line right here. Um, and it has a strong magnetic field. So as I, as I mentioned, this thing is a neutron star, one to two solar masses of material, all compressed down into something that's the size of a city. These are incredibly exotic objects. They're so hot, the surfaces are about a million degrees. So they give off copious x-rays, okay? Their densities are several times what the nucleus of an atom is. Matter of fact, these are are gigantic nuclei. They're made almost exclusively of neutrons. So they're gigantic city-sized nuclei. They uh, um, have their gravity, because they're so dense and so compressed, gravity is so strong it's a hundred billion times stronger than the surface of the Earth. If you were to come anywhere close to a neutron star, the tidal forces alone, and a tidal force by the way is just the fact that at the top of my head gravity is less than it is at my feet. So if I were to come anywhere near a neutron star, its gravity is so strong it would rip apart my body by tidal forces and you know, stretch me into spaghetti, thin, uh, spaghetti thinness just because of its tidal forces. Um, 10 billion times stronger than the Earth's gravity. They can spin up to over 700 times per second. I told you 30 times a second was a lot, but the one that a uh, graduate student and I, uh, we found 10 years ago is, got, is the record holder, 716 times per second. That's faster than a kitchen blender spins. That's faster than a race car engine rotates. That's faster than a drill spins. Yet this is the size of a city and more massive than a star. That's, I study this stuff every day and this blows my mind, okay? They have these magnetic fields. Don't worry about these weird units, these units that astronomers use called Gauss. But they have an extraordinarily strong magnetic fields. And what I want you to know is just look at these numbers, these 10 to the large numbers. Um, you can get an idea of the size of a magnetic field. You know, if you hold a compass in your hand, a compass can, you can detect the Earth's magnetic field with a compass very easily, you know, a pocket compass. The Earth's magnetic field is one Gauss. The, the weakest magnetic fields are a billion times the Earth's magnetic fields. That's the weakest ones. The magnetars, which I'll talk a little about uh, later, can be uh, a hundred or can be a thousand trillion times the, the magnetic field of, of the Earth. I mean, truly exotic objects. We don't understand exactly how the emission comes off, comes off of them, but the emission, the radio emission that we see and sometimes X-rays and gamma rays comes off in these out of the magnetic poles and because they're, this thing is turning, um, and the magnetic axis is not on the rotation axis, as it rotates just like a lighthouse, whenever my arm sweeps by you, you see a pulsation. That's why we call them pulsars. They're not actually flashing. They're just rotating like a lighthouse. And so that beam causes something that looks like flashing light. And 
This also blows my mind. The most energetic ones, like the crab pulsar itself, there's so much energy coming off these that they can give off more than 10,000 times the energy that our sun gives off. And it's only coming from rotation. Once again, there's no fusion, there's no chemical reactions. This is purely rotation of the star being turned in to gamma rays and x-rays and radio waves um, and particles. I mean, that's extraordinary. Uh, if you can't tell, these are truly exotic objects. Okay, really, really amazing. And one of the things that I do in my science, I mean, this stuff blows me away, but one of the whole keys of my science is to forget about all that and, and just think of them as perfect clocks. Because what happens if we have a lighthouse out spinning in the middle of space and it's giving off, if it's rotating perfectly, like a, this is exactly like a perfect gyroscope or a perfect flywheel, every time it passes we see a perfect flash of light, it's like a tick of a clock. And we can use those clock ticks to make really beautiful measurements of other, other objects that are out there in space. So this diagram, I've got to explain a little bit. This is the pulsar person's version of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And remember, that's the star diagram that shows you how the lives of stars. Well, the pulsars do the same thing. We measure two things, how fast the pulsar is spinning. This is also logarithmic, so this is a millisecond, uh, 10 milliseconds, a, a tenth of a second, one second, 10 seconds. And this is the spin down rate. I said that it's turning rotation energy and giving off rotation energy, so it has to be slowing down. That shows you how fast the pulsar is slowing down. So the ones up here at the top are, are slowing down rapidly. The ones at the bottom are slowing down. They're staying almost the exact same rate. Okay? They're barely slowing down at all. And we can see most of the pulsars are here um, in this diagram, and there's a few outliers. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these. The neat thing is we can turn these two numbers, how fast they're spinning and how fast that, that spin rate's changing, into physical parameters. We can use it to estimate the ages of the objects. We can use it to estimate how strong the magnetic field is because, by the way, the stronger the magnetic field, it's, it's moving a magnetic field that causes particles to be given off. So the stronger the magnetic field, you give off more particles. That means you slow it down faster. So the faster it's slowing down, the stronger the magnetic field is. And B is what physicists call magnetic field. So stars up here have really strong magnetic fields. Stars down here have really low magnetic fields. Stars over here are young. Pulsars down here are old. And we can figure this out just by these two parameters and a few basic physics equations, which I won't show you. So the young pulsars, like the crab I already showed you, sits right there on this diagram. And there's a, all those other ones that are in supernova remnants sit up here. As they give off energy, remember they're, they're, they're trading rotational energy, they're giving it off. That means they're slowing down with time. That means they move this way on the diagram. And their magnetic fields, we don't think, change, so they move down this way. And so, sure enough, we see the young pulsars here, and eventually they end up with all their other companions out in the galaxy in this big blob. So they move down and right. Just like on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, how stars move up that red giant branch and then down to the white dwarfs. Well, eventually they spin so slow, um, so this is where they end up with normal pulsars, eventually they keep on moving, and they, pat, they end up passing this line where they're spinning too slow so that the ma if you move a magnetic field, you can't get enough electric field to accelerate particles. And when they're, when they're rotating too slowly then, that means they shut off as radio pulsars. We call that going into the graveyard, okay? So out in our galaxy, there are millions and millions of neutron stars that have gone this way and are piled up here that we can't even see because there's no way to see them. They've cooled, they're, they're, they're too cool to see by their x-rays, they're too far away to, to see by any kind of other light, they're not giving off radio waves because the, the emission mechanism has turned off. Um, and, and basically pulsars live between 10 to 100 million years. And given that our galaxy is 5 billion years old, this is short compared to the, to the lifetime of our sun or our galaxy. So there's tons, there's a whole ton of neutron stars that are here that we just, it's impossible for us to see. But not all supernova make pulsars. And here's a very famous supernova remnant. This little ring here, it's in, the, it's in the nearest galaxy next to us. It's a supernova that went off in 1987. We know that a neutron star was created because we can see um, these, uh, uh, there was a burst of particles called neutrinos that are given off when every time you turn a proton into a neutron, and to make a neutron star you have to turn a lot of protons into neutrons, uh, there was a burst of these neutrinos that was measured when this thing exploded. 
But people have searched and searched and searched with x-rays and gamma rays and radio waves, including me using, <laughs> using the biggest telescopes in the world um, and the most sophisticated instruments and software, and we have not found the pulsar that we think must be there. So there are other neutron stars that don't turn into pulsars. Here's another beautiful example, uh, this beautiful supernova remnant that dominates the northern sky in almost every other wavelength except for optical light. Here's optical. You need the Hubble Space Telescope to make this very dim picture. But in radio and x-rays, it is booming bright. This is one of the brightest objects in the sky at both of those uh, frequencies. And it shows up incredibly well. Um, at the center of this beautifully spherical um, nebula, you might see something there. Here's, the, here's a composite image of, of infrared x-rays and I think radio waves. And right there in the center, that is a neutron star. We know that's a neutron star. It has every property in the x-rays of being a young neutron star. But there are no pulsations. We've looked in gamma rays, x-rays, radio waves, every way. We've used the biggest and best telescopes in the world. And we see quite a few of these objects. We call them compact central objects. It sounds really boring, uh, given that they're actually pretty interesting. Um, but we don't know why these things don't have pulsations. Is there something wrong with their magnetic fields? Don't they have big enough magnetic fields? Are they somehow spinning too slowly to cause any kind of pulsations? Um, is there something weird about their surface that, 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 that doesn't let x-ray light out in the way that we expect it to? We, we really don't understand. Th these, are, uh, these are kind of enigmas. Uh, and we see about a half a dozen of these in supernova remnants in our galaxy. There's another object, um, fascinating objects. Here's a supernova remnant, a bright, x-ray source in the very center. This is a so-called magnetar. These are objects that are very much related to pulsars. They're neutron stars. Um, and they probably, at least sometimes, give off radio pulsations. The thing is, their magnetic fields are so strong, they're about a thousand times stronger than a normal pulsar's magnetic field, that they spin down very rapidly. So they don't live long. They basically die very, very quickly as radio pulsars. But if you catch them early enough when you can still see their supernova, you can, you can often see some interesting um, things happening with them. And this particular object here, um, it, it's got an incredibly strong magnetic field, as I said, 1,000 times stronger than a normal pulsar. And when you put that much magnetic energy together, you get a bunch of crazy things that happen. When you pack that much magnetic energy together, you can actually cause even that dense neutron star surface, you can actually kind of rip it apart and cause it to, to stress and flex because there's so much energy in the magnetic field. To give you an idea how much energy, if you took a cubic centimeter, that's about the size of a sugar cube, of the magnetic field, if you're able to somehow cut out a, cubic, uh, a sugar cube's worth of magnetic field, in that cubic centimeter is more power than the human race has ever produced. Period. Out of all of our nuclear reactors, all of our atomic bombs, everything together, and that's what's stored in the magnetic field. That's not even talking about all the gravitational energy and everything else in these objects. Totally crazy. So these things live way up here on that diagram. And you can see there's a handful of them. There's, we, we know about 20 of these now. Um, and they're purely powered, not by rotation, like normal pulsars. These have so much energy in their magnetic field that they're powered by the magnetic field. So crazy magnetic objects. And they can do crazy things. Well, this object in 1998, um, this magnetar, this, it's called uh, soft gamma ray repeater, blah, blah, blah. Um, these give off gamma rays. Its magnetic field kind of twisted a bit, just like the sun does. It, it, the sun's atmosphere, the magnetic fields twist when we get solar storms. This thing, you twist them, this magnetic field, and it ripped, like kind of caused the crack in the neutron star's crust which sent a massive pulse of gamma rays through our galaxy. This thing is thousands of light years away, thousands of light years away. Yet this, this is the ionosphere on Earth. This is the measure of how ionized the top of the Earth's atmosphere is. And a gamma ray pulse hit, this is the gamma rays. When the gamma rays hit the satellite that was measuring it, the Earth's ionosphere became much more ionized. It ionized a chunk of our atmosphere. And then it took minutes for the ionosphere to recover. Because there's so many more gamma rays coming, these are the pulsations of the neutron star um, as it slowly rang down. This is only over a course of a couple minutes. But these gamma ray bursts, if this thing were to happen very, very close to us, it would fry our atmosphere and do really be, be really bad for us. The good thing is, 
There are no magnetars that live close to us. We know that because they show up brightly in x-rays and we know that there are no magnetars within a few hundred light years, uh, probably not even less than about a thousand light years from Earth. And so even if another one of these goes off, uh, it'll fry our atmosphere a little bit, but not enough to hurt us. But still, crazy what these things can do. So the last things I want, I want objects, these are the ones that are most dear to my heart, are these guys, which I didn't talk about. I told you about how the young pulsars move down here and then they die over here and making this big graveyard, but how did these guys get down here? Okay, these are the so-called millisecond pulsars. These are the ones that we use for basic physics tests, and they have almost no magnetic field. Magnetic fields, they're still very strong for Earth, but compared to pulsars, there's almost nothing. So these were discovered by this guy, one of my mentors, Don Backer, who unfortunately passed away a few years ago. Um, a, a fantastic discovery. Um, the first one pulsar, the first millisecond pulsar spins at 1.558 milliseconds. That's 640 times per second. It's 21 times faster than the crab pulsar spins. And this, for, for about almost 30 years, 25 years, was the record holder for the fastest spinning neutron star until the 716 hertz one I mentioned a little bit ago was found. Um, this is, oh, I'll, I'll play it for you, but this, it's spinning so fast it makes a tone. It's not like hearing a machine gun brrr, like the crab pulsar. It's actually a tone. Let me see if I can get this to work. Really annoying. I use that as my alarm. Uh, uh, um, but that, you know, it's above concert A on the piano keyboard, okay? That's a star spinning. That's not some, that's a star spinning. That's just ridiculous. Um, these things, because they have the low magnetic fields, even though they spin that fast, they're still giving off tons of energy, but they will spin that rapidly for a huge amount of time. So how do we get these things? Well, the, the millisecond pulsars are like this. You, the way you get them is by having a companion star. So if you make a pulsar in a supernova and there's a sun-like star in orbit around it, that's the key part. You have to have a sun-like star that stays there. Eventually what happens is this pulsar, just like all the other pulsars I mentioned, will give off energy and slow down and after 10 or 100 million years will die. Okay, it just becomes a dead neutron star. But a star, I already told you, those last billions of years. So this pulsar is long and dead, but say after one or two or five billion years, this thing decides to do what the sun's going to do and it turns into a red giant. As it turns into a red giant, it expands and it dumps material into a disk around the, the dead neutron star that's in the center. And we see this stage, this is an x-ray binary, just like Cygnus X1, we see these objects doing this. We see them in the x-rays, we, we see them dumping material, this happens, we know this happens, we, we observe it all throughout the galaxy. It's rare, but we still see dozens of these systems. Eventually, this evolution ends and the, the outer parts get ejected, this becomes a white dwarf, just like our sun's going to be. And what you're left over with, once this disk goes away, you have a white dwarf and this thing turns on as a millisecond pulsar because when it dumped this material, it, just like a basketball player hitting a basketball making it spin faster, this material falling onto the surface makes that neutron star spin much, much, much faster. It also buries a lot of that magnetic field that was there. It buries it underneath the material. And so this process, that this other star, revitalizes this pulsar, okay? We call it recycling. It takes something from the graveyard and puts it back to life. I mean, this really is the stellar undead. That's, these are like star zombies, right? They came back to life uh, by the recycling process. Um, so the other star gave it new life, and now that it's back to life, it's gonna last for billions of years um, because these things are perfect clocks. So how perfect clocks are they? Okay, so. At 7.30, oops, I missed it by a half hour. Um, so a half hour ago, <laughs> um, today, this particular pulsar, which is very well studied, spins exactly at this rate in milliseconds. And like any good scientist, we have to have an error bar on our measurements. So there's the error bar um, in that last digit, okay? We know that number, how fast it spins very, very precisely. But remember, it's giving off energy as its rotation is, is turned into the stuff that we can see. So that means that it's slowing down. Well, how fast is it slowing down? Well, the last digit 
changes by about one every half hour. So right now, this would, you know, since I'm wrong by a half hour, this would be 245 as opposed to 244. But that means that this is kind of like a cosmic odometer on your car. You can see this thing ticking out and going slower and slower. But if the last digit's changing by once every hour, that means that that digit changes only every 500 years. That means the first six digits are the same for 1,000 years. That's how pure and beautiful of a tone these things are. And because of that, we can use these perfect celestial clocks as tools to do basic physics. And we do it by this magical thing called pulsar timing, which I'll only very briefly explain. The important thing is, is we unambiguously count every single rotation of a pulsar over the time scale of years. So without missing a, a, a count. And we do it like this. Time is going this direction, and we're, we're rotating with the pulsar, so we're stacking pulses on top of one another. When we do that, that's an observation. We make these measurements of when the pulses arrive. We stack the pulses on top of each other. We can then make a model and predict forward. I can then go back with my telescope again, and I can predict when I, where I'm going to see my pulsar. And on my next observation, if my model's correct, the pulses line exactly up where, where my model is. Okay, and then I can come back another, another day or two later to my telescope, make another model measurement, and if I'm a little bit off, then I, I've exaggerated in this case. Usually we don't, make it, we, don't, we don't make it so we're that far off. But if we're a tiny, tiny bit off, um, then I tweak my model a little bit. I make my model a little bit better. That tells me a little bit more about the pulsar, where it is in space, what its binary orbital parameters are, how it's spinning down. Um, and we get a much better model for how the pulsar behaves. And we know exactly how many pulses are between these observations, down to the exact number. And when we do it correctly, we get data that looks like this. This is two years where we take the measurement minus the model. All we're doing is taking what we measured minus our prediction. And we're plotting how far off from zero we are. And in this case, you can see this is in microseconds. This is millionths of a second. Here's a day at the telescope. There's a whole bunch of measurements. They're all within a microsecond. And over two years, our measurements are perfect so that we can predict any individual pulse to 200 nanoseconds. A nanosecond is a billionth of a second. I can tell you where every individual pulse from that millisecond pulsar arrives. And if you do this properly so you don't miscount, you get unbelievably precise measurements. Here's an example of a, of a paper uh, that, that shows a, what we call a timing solution uh, for a millisecond pulsar. Here's that long number that I showed you. That's, that's the spin period of the pulsar about, I don't know, eight or nine years ago. Here's the position on the sky. This is a, a, like a micro arc second. That's something like the width of your hair on the moon from here. I mean, it's some absurd precision is, is, is the, the angle. Here's the, the, the parameters of the orbit to many, many decimal points. There's six or 10 decimal points of precision in all these measurements of the orbit, its position, how fast it spins down. We can use these things as truly precise measuring devices. And here's a really ni nice party trick example. Millisecond pulsars get created in circular orbits. Here's the eccentricity. The eccentricity tells you how circular the orbit is. If this eccentricity is zero, it's perfectly circular. But Kepler showed us that all things orbit with ellipses, okay? So nothing is a perfect circle in space. It's always going to have some eccentricity. And this has got 0.00001986. That's its eccentricity. So it's really close to zero, but it's not exactly zero. But I can't really think in terms of eccentricity. I don't know how circular that is, right? Well, the next line above it tells us how, wide, how big the orbit is. This is in terms of seconds. It's how long light takes to, to travel. It's called a light second. So this orbit is 3.3 light seconds across. Well, in terms of units that we can think better, the, sun, uh, the sun's radius um, is about 1.44 uh, 1 times the sun's radius is, the, is this same distance. Okay, it's about 10 to the 11 centimeters. Okay, so that's the size of the, cir of the circle we're talking about. It's about 1.4 times the radius of the sun, and it's got some eccentricity that's really close to zero. Well, but if we know this is an ellipse, I can say, hmm, Ellipses have a short side and a long side, right? What's the difference in length between the long side and the short side? That's something we can easily think about. That, that's, I, I, can tell, I can tell what that is. So if I measure the difference between the long side and the short side of the ellipse, it's 18.59 plus or minus 0.01 centimeters. It's that much. 
Yet this is the size of the sun. And we can measure how perfectly that circle is by timing a pulsar, by measuring when pulses arrive. This is how we do the really precise work, measure masses and do general relativity tests using millisecond pulsars. And two of the best telescopes in the world for this are owned by the US. The National Science Foundation funds these. The Arecibo telescope is the biggest in the world in Puerto Rico, 300 meters across. It's astounding. If you ever get to Puerto Rico, I highly recommend you go visit it. There's a beautiful visitor center there. And then this, in your own backyard, the Green Bank Telescope, run by the National Radio Astronomy Observatory over in Green Bank, West Virginia, 100 meters in diameter. These are uh, basically the size of semi-tractor trailer trucks here. This is, this is huge, okay? That's really big. Um, and we need big because pulsars are faint objects, okay? The other thing I'll say about this is that these things are making spectacular measurements of pulsars, but they're both in financial trouble. The NSF wants to cut funding on both of these, um, and it would be a total travesty, um, not only just to my career, uh, but it's the, uh, the amount of excellent science, but especially pulsar science that comes from these telescopes is, is amazing. Um, and they, they only cost uh, about five million, between five and eight million dollars per year to run each of them. I mean, it's piddly. Um, anyways, the U.S. Is, has really great stuff. Last couple of things I'm going to talk about. Here's one of the, the very famous objects. This one was the first binary pu uh, pulsar discovered, 59 millisecond spin period in an eight hour orbit. And it's a pulsar orbiting a neutron star. This was the first binary system ever found and it's two neutron stars orbiting each other in a highly eccentric, crazy relativistic orbit. And it has so much relativity in it it's easy uh, to measure. They measured it beautifully. These are curves that show that. This is a, a really amazing thing here. This are the me these are the measurements of how the orbit changed from 1975 to 2004-ish. These are the measurements. That curve is not a fit. That's the prediction of how the orbit would behave due to general relativity, Einstein's relativity. So you need Einstein's general relativity to predict this system. Newton's gravity, which explains everything in our solar system basically, cannot do it, okay? Really amazing stuff, and we can easily make these measurements. And this is the system where the graduate student and the advisor got the Nobel Prize um, back in 93. We're still doing this kind of stuff. This is beautiful work from the Green Bank Telescope. Another neutron star system. This one has two pulsars, a pulsar orbiting a pulsar, and we can measure one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, six different relativistic effects. Well, I won't go into the details. All those relativistic effects cross at this one point. That's a way of doing an extraordinary test of general relativity, of Einstein's theory of relativity, down to about 0.01%. Um, this is the kind of stuff you can do by counting pulses. A big project that I and a bunch of other people are involved in right now is we're using an array of millisecond pulsars, a whole bunch of millisecond pulsars around the sky, and we're using those arrays to try to measure ripples in space-time. Right now, this room, our galaxy, everything is being pushed and pulled apart um, at tiny levels by gravitational waves, ripples in space-time that are being created by supermassive black holes in other galaxies that are orbiting each other. And as they orbit each other, they change the distance between you guys, where you're my pulsars, and me, the telescope. And as the gravitational waves pull me away from you, all of your signals will be a little bit late. When the gravitational waves make me go back towards you, all of your signals will be a little bit early, but the pulsars back there will be a little bit late. It makes a very specific pattern on the sky that we can measure. And we, we're now doing this really well. We're, we, we need really excellent pulsars, and we need really fantastic timing precision of about 100 nanoseconds for a long time. And in the US, we're called Nanograv, um, uh, and we're using the GBT in Green Bank and Arecibo to do this. And we're hoping to have a detection within just a few years. This is another beautiful measurement. Uh, this is a pulsar. When the pulses go uh, around the companion star or near the companion star, the, the space time is bent by that star, according to Einstein's theory of relativity. And as the pulses from the pulsar go, go past it, we see a, a delay in the pulses. This, is a sh this shows you the delay as the pulsar moves behind the companion star. And it's of a few microseconds. We built a new instrument at Green Bank and we measured this spectacular relativistic delay as the pulsar went behind its white dwarf companion. This lets us measure the mass of the pulsar to extreme, to, to really beautiful precision. And it kind of tests general relativity at the same time. 
If we pretend that general relativity doesn't exist, this is the best we can do to fit our data. And you can see there's still a, this big pointy thing there, which is not good. Uh, it's a beautiful pointy thing, but it's not supposed to be there. Uh, if you simply turn on general relativity, it all goes away, and general relativity beautifully predicts these high precision pulsar data. And this signal is only a few microseconds. We're measuring pulses to just you know a microsecond in precision. The last thing is this guy that I want to mention. This is a fantastic system that the Green Bank Telescope found two years ago. Here's the pulsar in the center. It's a millisecond pulsar. It's being orbited every 1.6 days by a white dwarf. But there's that guy in the background. That guy is another white dwarf that's orbiting this every 327 days. It's a triple system, the first time we've ever seen a triple system, a millisecond pulsar being orbited by two white dwarfs. There's three stellar undead in the same system, all orbiting totally beautifully. There's the outer one going around, and you can see the inner one is tracing its orbit. This is a fantastic system. We just published it. We're going to be doing a spectacular test of general relativity with it within this year that no one has ever done before. Um, it's a test that you can't do. It's a way of testing the so-called equivalence principle. Uh, and this, this one pulsar will do it way better than any kind of system measurement you can do here on Earth. And this is what it looks like. Here's the center. Here's the little orbit. Um, we know the mass is, everything is completely well known because of the beautiful the pulsar timing. It's a white dwarf. We can see it. The, 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 this is the hot white dwarf. Um, we can measure it. Um, and this is the orbit. This is pretty cool. This shows you the delay as the pulsar is going in the orbit. It goes around the star, so it goes away from you, so there's a delay. It then it's coming in an orbit towards you, so it gets advanced. This shows you that delay. So this is how far the pulses are delayed by 70, 70 seconds on the back side, and it comes 70 seconds early on this side. And this is over 327 days. But if you zoom in right here, that's this. And here's the 1.6 day orbit. And all these are measurements. In our measurements, there's thousands of data points in every one of these little colored blob, blobs there. We have error bars on those measurements. The, the error bars are a million times too small to see <laughs> on this plot. That's how precise we've measured these orbits. These, these things are really exquisite tools. So what about the future? Well, right now we only know of about 2,000 pulsars in our galaxy and we think that there's somewhere between 30,000 and 50,000 pulsars in our galaxy that we could detect. We're only seeing the ones in our neighborhood, okay? There's a unbelievable riches out there still to find, okay? And some of them are gonna be really amazing. Uh, pulsars that spin faster than a millisecond, we think those should exist. Pulsars that orbit black holes, that would be amazing tests of general relativity. We could do, see things there that we've never been able to see before. A millisecond pulsar orbiting a millisecond pulsar to have two ultra precise clocks, um, it could be exquisite. And we think these things exist out there in our galaxy. Uh, and the neat thing is a bunch of huge new telescopes are being built right now. Meerkat is this am is amazing new telescope which will have the same sensitivity as the GBT but in the far southern hemisphere so it can see a different part of the sky. And then here is that the Chinese are building, like the Chinese tend to do, a ridiculously huge thing. It's 500 meters in diameter, so it's twice as big as Arecibo, twice the sensitivity of Arecibo. Uh, they had to move a village out of this hole um, in order to build this thing. Uh, and it's in construction right now. Both these telescopes will be operational by about 2018. Um, and they're going to be fantastic for pulsars. And then in the next decade, uh, 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 there's a telescope that's about uh, at least five times the, the collecting area of this called the Square Kilometer Array that's going to be built in the Southern Hemisphere. Right now the U.S. is not part of it, but I'm hoping that we get our butts in gear to fund science and especially astronomy and we'll join that project for the next decade because it'll be spectacular for pulsars. So just to finish up, I think you'll, you'll, you can see that I'm, I like these things a lot. Uh, these, these things are really amazing and, and I do work on this stuff every day and I love it. Thanks. So do we want to move, should we move this down in case people want to talk? Well, we have a microphone in that aisle. We'll get another one going. If you'd like to ask Scott some questions, by all means, please do so.
Yeah, any questions, either shout them out or come to the microphone. Don't be shy. I'm, I'm happy to answer some questions. Or if you want to leave, feel free. I'll go have a beer. <laughs> yeah. What makes the pulsar rotate? What makes a pulsar rotate? So uh, that's a good question. So when you have a star, the center of the star, stars rotate, but they rotate very slowly. They're very big. Like our sun rotates about once a month, OK? But that's still rotating. If you shrink the star by a factor of 1,000 or so, and the core of the star is shrinks by about a factor of 1,000 when it goes from the size of the Earth to the size of a city, when you shrink like that, just like a figure skater spinning and bringing her arms in, that makes that slow spin turn into a really fast spin. It's conservation of angular momentum. That, that's exactly what it is. So what makes this, this uh, star spin? Oh, what makes like the sun spin? Ah, yeah. that's a deeper question. So uh, what makes that spin is that everything, and it all goes back to the conservation of angular momentum. When you have a big cloud of gas, which makes the stars, okay, as the big cloud of gas starts to, 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 to collapse under gravity to, to make stars, even if you, if you try as hard as you can not to make something have a tiny bit of spin, in space it always has a tiny, tiny bit. And especially as, as you contract it, it always starts spinning faster because of conservation of angular momentum. So every time you make a disk and that disk turns into a star and makes planets, it always turns into a disk and there's always a little bit of rotation, um, conservation of angular momentum. Other questions? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about an article that came out where uh, Stephen Hawking was talking about that there may or may not be a, an event horizon with the black hole? Yeah, so this is, um, this is an, a, uh, a point of quite controversy in active research right now. Um, we don't know, as, as I said when I showed the black hole slide, we don't know the physics that goes on inside a black hole. And as a matter of fact, the, what we call the edge of the black hole, there's, not even an, there's no physical edge. You can't go touch a black hole. That's called an event horizon. And all the event horizon is, is it's the distance from the black hole at which light can't escape. That's the definition of the, black, uh, of the, of the event horizon. So if you start light out, if you, start, if you take a bit of light and say, go, run away, light, and you're just outside of the event horizon, it'll escape. But if you're just inside the event horizon, it won't escape. That's, that's the definition of the event horizon. So there's probably nothing physical there. But it does define what we call the event horizon. And, but what goes on inside of that is beyond physics. So general relativity does not describe what goes on inside there. And a bunch of very famous physicists have had some bets as to whether we'll ever be able to figure out by using clever techniques to figure out what's going on inside the event horizon. And, I, and uh, I'm not actually sure what's th the result of their bets right now, who is won and who's lost, or whether it's still in contention. But a lot of people are still thinking about that. Other questions? Yeah? Sorry. Um, for the spinning black holes, um, how come there's two event horizons? Oh, OK, so a spinning black hole, yeah, th this is getting into the details of some of the math of general relativity, which can be very complex. But if you, um, if you have a spinning black hole, what basically happens, just like if you spin a sphere, or if you spin the Earth or a ball, really, you know how the Earth, or the things become uh, like ob oblong or oblate, because it, the spin kind of poofs out the, the, the bottom. The same type of thing happens to space-time. Space-time has weird stuff that goes on near a black hole when it's spinning very rapidly. Space-time gets dragged around. Okay, that's frame dragging. But it also, you get something that's kind of like an event horizon. It's not actually a separate event horizon. But um, there's parts of space-time where you can't orbit. Um, you, you, can't, you can't make an orbit that, that goes uh, and is stable, for instance, within a certain radius. You're, that the orbit will always go closer and closer and eventually go in the black hole, even though light could escape. So there's, there's a couple extra weird zones. It's like the, er, er, what is it called, the ergodic zone or something. I can't even remember what it's called right now. But some weird zones that when you add spin, because space time gets dragged along, that, that extra stuff happens. But that's called the Kerr black hole is what, is what that's called. Yeah. Do you have a question? Yeah, what you, what you got? What will happen to B.Y. Uh, which, which star? I don't know. Why don't you, you tell me? I don't know which star that one is. It's the, it's the red oddball giant. It's bigger than the super giants. 
So if it, okay, if it's a if it's a really really big supergiant, it's going to probably have some kind of thing that's like a supernova, and it will probably become a black hole in the center. But what's going to happen to the outer parts? I'm not exactly sure. There's a few stars in our galaxy, these very very special stars, that we think have almost a hundred times the mass of our sun. There's a star called the Pistol Star, and there's a star called Eta Carina. Have you heard of those two? They're very famous big stars. And they're so, they're so huge and have so much going on that they're causing these big eruptions. One of them called Eta Carina was bright. It was one of the brightest stars in the sky in the 1800s and it's now really dim because it went through this big eruption and there's a famous Hubble Space Telescope picture of it. But they're all going to do something like a supernova within the next million years. Well, did you know B, Y, Q, is about the size of Neptune's That's crazy big. Yeah, that Betelgeuse is like that too. Betelgeuse is, is, is huge also. That's huge. That's amazing. You, you should give this talk. I will next year. Yeah. When you have a pulsar fall into the graveyard, is there any observations done with the magnetic field that it may remain, that may remain even though it's not spinning? Ah, yes, that's a good question. So, when things, yeah, there's no, as you can probably guess, there's not like a, a line where it, it's, a, it's a bright pulsar and all of a sudden it just turns off. It's, there's kind of a region where it's going slowly and it starts sputtering and flickering and we see a lot of pulsars that are spinning slowly that are sputtering and flickering. They're, we don't see pulses from them for minutes or hours or even days at a time and all of a sudden they'll, they'll sputter back with a couple pulses and then they'll go, they'll go away again. And something weird is going on in their magnetospheres and we, don't, we do not understand uh, the process that's happening there. But we think that beyond, the gr beyond that death line in the graveyard, occasionally, very rarely, we could see sputtering in the atmospheres of these stars and see flashes. Um, and as a matter of fact, there's a type of star called a rat, a rotating radio transient, that we think might be regular pulsars that have gone beyond the graveyard. But most of them will not do this um, because they're too slow to even do that, and they're just dead neutron stars that we'll never see. Question over here. Yeah. yeah um, is there a reason that the magnetic field axis is off kilter from the rotational axis? Uh -huh. Another good question, and one that we don't really know the answer to. So there's a lot of things about pulsars, which I will wave my hands a lot because we have a general rough idea why they are, but we don't know the details. And this is one of them. And it has, some, it has something to do with the supernova mechanism. So when that massive star uh, explodes, the core of the star collapses, that's a very chaotic process and it's not perfectly symmetric because there's rotation, there's these big convection cells on the top of the star and that causes, causes it not to be perfectly spherical. And so you get all sorts of turbulence and all sorts of uh, basically chaotic, um, a chaotic mess um, that causes the, the conservation of angular, angular momentum to be slightly off uh, from everything else. The other thing is, is that everything in the center of a star is ionized. It's all ionized hydrogen because it's so hot in the center of the star. Whenever you move ionized gas, for those of you who are physics students, if you move, make a current, what do you generate? A magnetic field. Every time you generate a current, you generate a magnetic field. So if you have rotation of ionized material, you're making a generator and you're generating um, magnetic field. So you, you're, you're somehow making magnetic field along with rotation and if because of all the chaoticness, when that locks in, sometimes it's not quite lined up with the rotation. But once again, that's a very hand wavy explanation. But our physics simulations that people do about supernova seem to show that that's very much the case. Anything else? Yes? What percent of your salary would you pay to see Beetlejuice go supernova? <laughs> <laughs> uh, hmm. I, I'm, I got a lot of cool stuff going on without, without gambling on Beetlejuice, but I would, uh, I'd give 5% of my salary, I guess. <laughs> or w one year, one year of 5% of my salary. <laughs> yeah. What is it that makes the field stronger and weaker, like, in space? The, the ma magnetic field? Yeah, or just, like, fields in general. Uh, so, well, it, that's it's a very different answer depending on which fields. I mean, talking about gravitational field, magnetic fields? Uh, magnetic, I guess. So, magnetic fields in space in general, almost everywhere through the universe, even between galaxies, there are magnetic fields. Very, very faint. And once again, this all goes back 
um, to the, the fact that whenever you move charged particles, you create magnetic fields. And whenever you have stars that are bright, they ionize hydrogen, so you have ionized gas everywhere. And because of gravity, gas is moving. So you always have in the universe moving charged particles. Therefore, you always have induced magnetic fields. And so once you start moving those magnetic fields and then moving the charged particles, it basically, um, th there always, there's always this interplay between the two and you end up locking them together. If you, if you bring the ionized gas together, you, you make the magnetic field stronger. If you move the magnetic field lines together, you move the charged particles together. And so it's this movement of charged particles that's always causing magne magnetic fields to be there everywhere we look. But they're very, very different strengths. The, yes? Do black holes die or disappear or anything like that? So, um, Stephen Hawking, a very famous physicist, there's a thing called Hawking radiation. And this goes along with the, uh, the question over there about what happens at the event horizon. When you, move, when you put together um, quantum mechanics and general relativity, so quantum mechanics is the physics that describes the very, very small atoms, nuclei, stuff like that. It's how the reason computers work is because of quantum mechanics. We know quantum mechanics works. It's real. You know, it's in your pockets with our cell phone. General relativity, it works. I've showed you the data, right? Gen these are both work. The problem is that general relativity and quantum mechanics don't mesh together um, when we really think they should. There should be a theory of gravity that meshes well with quantum mechanics. So sometime we think there's going to be a problem, and probably general relativity, when we get to a certain energy scale or certain density, some problem characteristic will show up. And this is one of the reasons why we keep testing general relativity, is to try to find when general relativity breaks. But because there's this kind of disconnect between the two, at the boundary of the black hole, at the event horizon, quantum mechanics can take a charged particle. And in quantum mechanics, you can make particles appear out of nothingness, and they'll make a pos like a positive charged particle and a negative charged particle, and together they cancel each other out. Um, they, th there's no, uh, if they're both going in the other direction, there's no net energy, there's no net angular momentum, but quantum mechanics says you can actually make particles like that appear. If you did that right at the event horizon, you can cause one charged particle to go in the black hole and one to leave it. That's a big problem because the, you effectively lose information then. If you're outside of space, in, in regular space, I said there's no net energy gain or loss. But if you put anything in a black hole, it's gone. You've lost it. So there's all these quantum mechanic issues with the, the edge of a black hole. And what Hawking radiation is, is a basically it's a way that quantum mechanics can be used to cause an, a black hole because of this, this process of chucking one particle out and keeping one in, you can cause a black hole to evaporate by quantum mechanics can chuck particles out. Um, but that takes a ridiculously long time. For a normal black hole that I showed, I don't even remember the number. I don't know, do you know the number? It's 10 to the, yes, yeah, way, way longer than the age of the universe. I mean, like billions of times, or I don't even know, a, a lot longer than the age of the universe. Black hole is the size of an asteroid, a small asteroid, which is a, you know, the size of Paris and not, not nearly as dense as the objects you talked about. You can form right at the beginning of the universe. They just now evaporate. Yeah, so, and, and that's the size of an asteroid. The, so these ones, the ones that are much, much bigger, they take way longer uh, to, to evaporate. So it's, um, this, is, this is kind of a, so it's a, it's kind of a mental idea of what happens when quantum mechanics and, uh, and general relativity get together, but no one has ever seen a black hole give off Hawking radiation or evaporate, nor do I think we actually ever will. <laughs> Yeah. If that's true, then could that be a reason why there's more matter than antimatter? Uh, so I, that's a question that I can't actually give you a good answer, and I'm not sure how many people can. The, we, I don't think we know why there's a preponderance of matter as opposed to antimatter. Uh, does anyone know? I don't know the answer to that, and I think it's, I think it's actually quite a big mystery. Okay. Um, yeah. Yes. You're talking about the black holes from, from the star that's similar to the regular size ones as opposed to the supermassive in the center of galaxies. Is there a difference in the formation of those? <laughs> yes, absolutely. And we actually don't know how the supermassive ones in the centers of galaxies form. So there's a couple ideas. Uh, one of the ideas is that 
the very earliest stars, the very, very first generation of stars that formed, in general, stars need gas besides hydrogen to form because the, the carbon, the oxygen, the stuff that stars, that supernova and stars make that become us, right? We're all made of star stuff, that famous thing that Carl Sagan says. It's really true. Every atom in your body made in a star. Uh, the, um, all that stuff, uh, where was I going with this? We asked about... I'm asking about how you get those massive black holes. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, the very, very first generation of stars, there was only hydrogen then, basically. There was a little bit of helium. But the hydrogen is what, is, is, what collapsed and so, is what collapsed to make the first stars. And it's thought that those stars burnt were actually huge stars, maybe even a thousand times the mass of our, of our sun. And they burnt very, very rapidly through their fuel and quickly collapsed into big, relatively big black holes, like maybe even 100 solar masses. It's also thought that they possibly formed in these very dense clusters. So if you make a whole bunch of these very massive stars, then all these 100 solar mass black holes can then co coalesce together. And then very quickly, then you have a thousand or a couple thousand solar mass black hole. When you have that, that's enough of a seed that, that by just by gathering gas over the rest of the billions of the age of the universe, you can grow it to be billions of solar masses. Because once it makes it to the center of the galaxy, gas is always funneled to the center of the galaxy just because of basically friction. Uh, and then it keeps feeding the black hole. But that's, once again, that's a hand wavy idea right now. That's an, that's an area of very active research. Yeah. Yes? If, if matter creates black holes, Ah, whew. now we're verging on the realm of science fiction. Uh, so first off, we don't know if white holes even exist. Uh, white, the, the idea of a white hole potentially, possibly, is that, you know, I said we don't know what the physics is inside of a black hole, right? So there is an idea, and it, it is possible to work it into general relativity, that inside a black hole is a wormhole, and that basically it, it's a connection of two different distinct points in space-time. And the idea of a black hole is if a black hole, nothing can escape, everything's being dumped in this side. If there's a wormhole, then the stuff's got to get squirted out someplace else. Okay, the problem is we don't see anything like white holes any place in the universe right now. Um, but if you, as a thought process, according to, to general relativity, that type of thing is possible in general relativity, but does it actually occur in real life? I don't know. Um, but I doubt it has anything to do with antimatter. Because it's probably, it would be the exit of a wormhole rather than an antimatter version of a black hole. Does that help? Cool. Anything else? Yeah. Say again? Terzan 5. Terzan 5? Yeah, so Terzan 5 is one of my favorite objects in the sky. So Terzan 5 is a globular, I have a beautiful movie, which I'd have to dig it out of my laptop, but it's in the very center of our galaxy. It's very close to the, cent the, the supermassive black hole, only, well, galactically speaking, it's like a few neighbors down, you know, down the street from the black hole at the center of our galaxy. Um, but right through all the dust towards the center, and it's a massive cluster of stars. It's a globular cluster. There are these stars that are, they're, they're billions of years old, about 12 billion years old, these stars. They all formed at the same time. There's about a million of them in Terzan 5, and they're all in the area the size of a volume between us and our nearest star. So the nearest star to us is Alpha Centauri, it's actually, actually Proxima Centauri, but that's four light years away. If you took that distance and stuffed a million stars in it, that's what Terzan 5 would be like. And they're all orbiting each other. And these, these objects, the reason why I love them, is that because if you create a pulsar there, long ago, 12 billion years ago, if you created a pulsar, when the stars went supernova, because all those stars were long dead, but then, because the stars are so dense, they can interact. Stars in our galaxy are so far away that our stars never interact with each other. But in a globular cluster, you can get a star that interacts. And if you have a binary, for instance, that's orbiting, and another star comes by, you can have a little triple dance, and you can fling out one of the partners. You can have partner swapping and all sorts of crazy 70s stuff going on there. And uh, what you're left with is a, a, you can take that old dead neutron star that's past the graveyard and put a normal star in orbit around it, and then that star can turn into a red giant and recycle the pulsar. So globular clusters are factories for millisecond pulsars, and one of the big things that I did in my postdoc was I found uh, me and my collaborators, not just myself, we found 33, now 35 I think is the total number, of, of pulsars in one cluster in this tiny little part of the sky by using the GBT 
the Green Bank Telescope uh, towards the center of the galaxy. And they're very interesting exotic pulsars, including these eccentric binaries and all sorts of crazy stuff. So really fun exotic pulsars can be found if you look in the right places. Over here. But before it starts to, to defy the laws of physics? Well, that's a tricky question given that we don't understand the laws of physics inside a black hole. But I'll give you an example. So the, the, the biggest, at the center of basically every galaxy, we think there are supermassive black holes. And by supermassive, I mean at least a million solar masses. So like Cygnus X1 that I showed you is about 10 solar masses. So at the center of the galaxies, we're talking a million solar masses. At our galaxy, in the middle of our galaxy, Sagittarius A star, that's the black hole's name, is about four million solar masses. That's a kind of a puny though on galactic scales. There are galaxies that have billions or maybe even 10 billion solar mass black holes. And the crazy thing about those black holes, this is really bizarre, the black holes get bigger the more mass you put in, but bigger in that the event horizon gets bigger. But remember what I said, the event horizon is not really a thing you can touch. If you take a multi-billion solar mass black hole, the event horizon is almost the size of our solar system. And when you have a black hole that big, the tidal forces that I mentioned for like a neutron star are puny. So unlike a neutron star where you can't get anywhere close or you'd be ripped rip to shred, or Cygnus X1, the tidal forces would rip you to shred, if you got next to a, a 10 billion solar mass black hole, you could walk right through the event horizon. The trouble is you couldn't turn around and walk back out. Uh, so you'd be walking right to the center because gravity, even though you walked right through, you, you, there'd be no feeling, it wouldn't feel different at all, but you would just be like sliding, you, you know, gravity would be pulling you towards the center. Um, so it's a very bizarre thing. It's, it's so counterintuitive to the way that we deal with, with, with regular life. But still, that would still, we think, obey all the laws of general relativity. It just wouldn't obey the laws of your mind. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Would quantum entanglement still work if like one of the particles went into a black hole? Ah, I'm not even going to touch this one because this, this is like related to these bets that people like Stephen Hawking are having. Uh, and if they can't agree, uh, I know I certainly have no chance of being able to, to tell the, the answer to that. But once again, that, that's this weird boundary layer between quantum mechanics and general relativity where people do not understand what's going on. We really do not. That's the forefront of, of theoretical physics knowledge. I'm going to take the opportunity to ask the last question. Okay. So if I remember history, right, one of the first exoplanets found was around a pulsar. That's right. What's one of the, what are the prospects of finding exoplanets around these systems using, I don't know, some of the data approaches? Yeah, so this is an interesting question. I've actually thought about this and, I, and done a little bit of work on this. So the very first exoplanets that were found were found around a millisecond pulsar. It was like the fourth millisecond pulsar we ever discovered. I showed you Don Backer, my, my mentor who found the first one. Only about three or four years later, a professor at Penn State named Alex Volchin uh, found a, a millisecond pulsar that at first looked like an isolated millisecond pulsar. He didn't have a binary companion, it was all normal. He started that really magical process of pulsar timing and things weren't quite adding up. Turned out that he had found a system of three planets uh, and the planets are all Earth mass or below. There's like an Earth mass planet, a Mars mass planet, and a Moon mass planet. Um, and pulsar timing was so precise that he was able to map out and measure the masses of all those planets beautifully. And even now, if you look at the best, the most cutting edge planetary results now, using optical techniques, which is what all the new techniques are using, we're just now getting, being able to find things that, which are close to optical or uh, Earth masses. But this was done with pulsar timing, a completely new technique. But here's the bizarre thing. He found this planetary system, which has been confirmed, it's definitely there, with the fourth millisecond pulsar. We now know of about 300 millisecond pulsars, and there's only one other system that has a planet, and it's a weirdo. It's in one of these globular clusters, so it almost certainly had this an exchange encounter thing, and probably a planet from someplace else got caught around a millisecond pulsar, probably. We don't know for sure, but probably. So out of those other 300 millisecond pulsars, why don't they have planets? We know they don't because pulsar timing is so precise that we would have seen them like that. 
Um, I've already showed you, you know, I showed you the pulsar, our data. There's no extra wiggles, and the wiggles would be huge for these planets. That's how precise our signals are. So that's a bit of a bizarre thing. When you find a weirdo system, the fourth one you ever find, you find something totally weird about it, planets, and then 300 more and not another planet, basically? That's bizarre, but yet astronomy is filled with stuff like that, and to me that makes it one of the really fun sciences to study because we find weird and exotic and crazy stuff all the time, and it makes it great to go into work. I love it. Thanks. Thanks, Matt.